So, uh, let's start with this. Who already is very familiar with India? Who is somewhat familiar with India? And who feels completely like if they had to point at a blank, I, I can take your uh, if, if Raise your hand if, if you looked at a blank map of the world, you're not sure you could be able to point to the country. Okay, so two of you admit that. Um, what I thought I would do is, is uh, start by explaining uh, something even more urgent, which is why the heck am I kicking this off as a, somebody who's not conspicuously Indian? Uh, well, one, one argument could be that uh, Indo-Europeans were actually uh, very closely related, so I almost qualify as Indian. But um, I thought I'd uh, uh, point to some of the uh, reasons that maybe um, I'm not totally the worst choice. Um, to begin with, I've been there twice, uh, been to 11 different locations in India. Um, my brother married an Indian, so I have uh, an Indian cousin now. Um, and um, I've also co-authored and done research there. Now, mysteriously, this is not cooperating. All right. Uh, that's one of the photos of uh, me back in 2006 uh, planting trees at a, a nonprofit uh, in northern India. It's actually a very entrepreneurial nonprofit. Um, what this uh, nonprofit is doing is solving at least three problems at once. Um, I didn't plan to start with this, but since the photo came up first from the overhead, I'll start with this example. Um, one of the problems is desertification. They cut down all the trees in one area of northern India, in Rajasthan. What happens when you cut down all the trees? You run out of wood, first of all. So that, that's one resource that you could be selling or making things with that's gone. What happens to the ability of the local environment to retain water? It's gone. It's gone. One of the valuable functions of forests in their natural state is that they absorb rainwater, release it slowly, they create shade. The temperature is much hotter than it used to be. It didn't used to be a desert, it used to be a forest in that area. What happens when people uh, can't grow anything because it's too hot and dry? So traditional farming goes away. Traditional uses of the forest have gone away. What do desperate people do? City. Either move to the city or if they stay there, they become desperate. And they do things that you're, you'd never want your mother or sister or daughter to do to make ends meet. Prostitution becomes an issue. Um, Ill illiteracy becomes a problem. Education, people stop worrying about education if they can't feed themselves. It's a vicious spiral into really a, a, a sort of a hellish state, right? And it's all linked with uh, environmental devastation. Now, uh, if you talk to the founder of this nonprofit who's visited our campus and even led a, a yoga session in this room uh, a few years ago, um, he says, look, the solutions came from ourselves. It, it, it's not always some first world charitable organization that comes up with a solution. We can sometimes think of these things ourselves, solutions, better than anybody else. And definitely just donations, while donations serve a role in, in crises, they're, they're not a sustainable way of getting ourselves out of a hole like this. So he said one of the, the key things that come out of 5,000 years, conservatively estimated, of, of Indic civilization is to look at things holistically, right? Look at things as a system whole rather than just as a discrete part. Um, and to take uh, a nonviolent nurturing approach to the problem. Um, looking at the problem holistically, they arrived at a very elegant, simple solution build an earthen dam with their own hands to catch rainwater in a valley and plant trees around it. Reforestation with their own hands was the first step. What can you then do in the immediate area around this catchment where you catch the rare rains when they do fall? What can you start planting around that? Crops. Crops, fruit trees. You begin to revive local agriculture, subsistence agriculture. You now have work that is nurturing good, healthy work for people that were otherwise desperate. What can you then start doing once you attract people to this location and have them working and producing something of value? Um, 
make more. You can, you can make more, you can expand that, but you can also require that, okay, now we're going to sit down for half an hour and talk about family planning. Look, I'm a proud Indian woman, the, the woman next to me here. What describe Hi, now that's, on, that's live streamed, right? We can't edit that out. <laughs> that was intentional. That was Indic ballet. All right, um, this woman described uh, a very uh, funny uh, thing that happens in some of those family planning meetings. She sits down with a group of, of 30 women and says, you know, look, uh, one of the reasons that you don't have enough food is that you have a lot of kids. And she has to get over this cultural hurdle that they say, well, how many kids do you have? And she goes, well, I have three. See, I, I tried to limit my family. And, and they look at her and say, ha, I have 30. Right? <laughs> or, or some large number like that. So there's a, a little bit of a, a cultural uh, barrier uh, there, even though she's, she's Indian and trying to convince them that smaller family sizes work. But at least that nonprofit, by virtue of just reforesting, has created employment and now can provide uh, counseling as far as family planning and maybe other solutions. Um, and they also start providing education at that location for the children. Uh, basically, it's a, a virtuous, virtuous cycle rather than a, a self-destructive cycle that they've started. Uh, and again, it wasn't the result of some kind of uh, first world charity uh, or you know, people coming from abroad and giving them a solution to their problem. It was a, a native, uh, indigenous solution, and maybe one that we can learn from. Um, okay, enough of that picture. You're convinced they've been to India? Okay, All right, great. Now we can move on uh, to maybe other topics. Um, I want to uh, speak uh, briefly about some other reasons that maybe I wasn't a totally irrational uh, choice. Uh, as mentioned, I've been to 11 uh, locations. Uh, lectured at one of their business schools uh, in Indian Institute of Management Indoor. Uh, they also are uh, net rainwater positive. They catch more rainwater and use that rainwater more. They, they actually catch more than they use. So they're net rainwater positive. They don't draw from the public infrastructure or from private wells. They actually catch more than they use. Uh, and it's something they're very proud of. Um, okay, and I'll talk about some of these people that I interviewed at Kolkata and Jamshedpur and Bombay. Um, uh, quick plug for something that we've done at this university related to sustainability that doesn't always get uh, enough attention. We're, we're, we can be very proud of ourselves that not only do we have one of the only centers for Indic studies, but we also have the first sustainability port, report in the world uh, to meet the highest standard. Uh, in the world. Um, okay, and since 2007 I've been teaching courses related to both of these topics, so those are my qualifications. And as I mentioned, um, that's my Indian cousin. Uh, I thought this would get some laughs, or at least some awe, oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> it also, for whoever's watching as an administrator, look, even on my vacations I'm working. <laughs> That, that's proof that, you see, well, it's not really proof, but that's, that's my brother, and that's the one that married the, uh, the Indian, uh, and that's why uh, our family is, is part Indian now. Okay, so basics about India. Some of you said that uh, you couldn't place it on a map, so let's quickly take care of those basics. Uh, where uh, is India held as the civilization? Uh, what kind of a government it is? What's the population size? Sound, sound reasonable that we should know those basics before we leave the room? Okay. Let's start with a very simple drawing of uh, the United States so we can orient ourselves relative to where we are. Uh, there's Florida, there's the West Coast, right? Here's Cape Cod <laughs> in Massachusetts, right? There's, there's Canada up there, Alaska does something like that, right? Okay. And you know California's like over here, right? This is Massachusetts. <laughs> then you got something like South America, all right? Uh, Europe is something like this, um, right? There's something like Denmark there, and then you got England and Ireland. And, yeah. There's the rest of Europe. Italy somewhere like that. All right, we, we all, being more European derived, we, we're kind of more comfortable placing Europe. All right, which way do I go for India? East. Right. This is the Atlantic, by the way. East. East. So go this way. Yeah. All right. Josh, you're getting this. Um, Africa, Middle East, Arabia, okay, and we finally get to India, Australia's over here, New Zealand's over here, uh, what's the big country here? China, we're 
talking about <coughs> India here. And uh, all right, so we're we oriented. Everybody can now place India on the map of the world. Great. Right. Okay. Becoming a little bit more serious. Um, the places uh, I've been, uh, Bombay. That nonprofit is located right there. Um, and Kolkata is uh, where we spoke with somebody that we're going to be talking about uh, in the next few minutes. Um, and there are some other places as well. Uh, some more basics. Population of India. Does anybody know it offhand? Damn. You checked. That's right. That's exactly right. It was 1.1 billion when I started teaching about India. Congratulations. It's just grown by about the same population as the, a third of the size of the United States in about four or five years. 20 million people a year to 30 million per year added at the current rate. So it's uh, 1.2 billion people, roughly uh, what percentage of the world is either Chinese or Indian? China has China has a little bit more. China has about 1.3. So you got two and a half billion out of seven billion. Somebody who's a little bit better at percentages can calculate that. But it's over 25% of the world is either Indian or Chinese, right? Uh, India, world's largest fill in the blank. What does their billboard advertise to Pakistan? The world's largest democracy, democracy right? Uh, if you cross the border on foot, that's the big billboard they have antagonizing the Pakistanis. <laughs> Welcome to the world's largest democracy. Um, it's uh, language, what, what makes it so friendly uh, to us to either visit or do business with them. English. Most educated people speak English. Uh, their system of laws, same to ours. What, what, what did we share as far as uh, imperial masters? The, the American colonies? Right. They were also part of the British Empire. In fact, they were the, je the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. The Queen's jewels are stolen goods. The crown jewels of the Queen of England are from India. She wears stolen jewelry. Yes, stolen from the great country that we're talking about right now. So, uh, but by virtue of that legacy of, of their colonial past shared with us, we share the same language, at least with most of the educated people. Uh, the legal system. Also, uh, the common law tradition, the same that we have here. Uh, this is one of the reasons it's so uh, comfortable doing business there. Also, uh, when it's daytime here, it's what time of the 24-hour cycle over there? Nighttime, right. So uh, those are some basics. Democracy, uh, English is spoken, common law system. A lot of that is not news to some of you, but to some of you, I guess it's, it's good orientation background, right? Okay, let's talk about the world's current crises because the rest of the talk is about how Indian examples or, or wisdom have, are contributing to solutions to world problems. So what are some examples of world problems? What are the biggest ones? We already hinted at one. There's seven billion on the planet. There's seven billion people on the planet. What, where are we going to max out this century? Nine. Nine, nine roughly nine billion people. So we're, we have, we're going to be getting to nine billion people What's, uh, what are all the environmental trend lines indicating? What's going on with the, the state of our life support system on the planet? Right. Arable land going down, fish stocks going down, quality, every environmental indicator is going down. Even Eskimo milk has toxic levels of PCBs, wouldn't pass food safety standards. That's the pervasiveness of pollution around the planet. Right? How many people have heard of uh, the term mass extinction? It's still a minority of most rooms are aware that we're living through the sixth mass extinction of life on the planet, due largely to, to us destroying natural habitat and polluting the heck out of the environment. Right? Uh, how many of you have heard of the, the phenomenon of, of frog mutations around the planet? Okay. Uh, so how do we summarize all of this? Well, what's the biggest, really the, the biggest challenge of this century? I, I, I beg you to think of a bigger one. 
Right, how do we keep going? How do we keep this civilization functioning without mass death and suffering later this century? Um, it's not just me, it's not a bunch of, uh, you know, liberal academics or something that, that talk about this. Since the 1970s and 80s, it's actually our defense agencies have been talking about the wars of this century, population displacement, suffering, violence, civil unrest, political revolutions, will be linked to environmental causes. It's almost inevitable. That's what the trend lines show almost has to happen, right? Um, to give one example, uh, the general trend line for the Himalaya, which are the source of water for India and China, that's in doubt whether that water source will continue to provide as much water as it historically has. What happens to people when food and other basic needs either become scarce or very, very expensive? What do they do? They start fighting, they start revolting. What happened to food prices just before the Arab Spring in places like Tunisia? Why was it foreseeable that you'd have revolution in the street? Simple demographics and, and, and combined with food prices. Uh, the demographics, for decades we've known that there's this youth bulge, a huge amount of young people coming into the workforce that will not have enough to do. Right? We knew for a long time going into this that certain basic subsistence needs are going to get more expensive. That means if people don't have a job to go to, they can't afford basic needs, they, they will seize on a, on a pretext to start revolting against the system. They're going to be unhappy with whatever system it is. If you have levels of unemployment that high, uh, nothing else to do. Uh, it's not necessarily democracy at stake, right? People in China live very happily without a uh, fully fledged democracy. Um, I would uh, argue that uh, we're going to see more of what we've seen in the last year or two. And it could get uglier. There's some projections that the whole population of the planet might fall between violence, famine, and greater rates of disease, we might experience a population collapse from a peak of 9 million to as low as 300 million, possibly. People on opposite ends of the political spectrum who have worked in the defense area but both say that that's not just possible, it's actually a probability. You look at what happens on an island of deer when you kill off the predators. What do they uh, keep doing? Do they stop eating? They keep eating, right? Do they stop procreating? Do they stop multiplying? What eventually happens to the population of deer? It starts growing exponentially. What happens when food becomes scarce? Basic resources become scarce. Crash. It doesn't level off. It doesn't gradually ease up. It doesn't do this. It crashes. To pre pre-equilibrium uh, state, right? Here's the population with predators controlling the population, keeping it in equilibrium with everything else. Population spikes and then crashes below equilibrium level. Uh, we've watched this happen off Alaska when we've killed off the predators. Right? So um, we could say that the biggest crisis of the century is really sustainability. How do we keep civilization going? How do we keep roughly 9 billion people on the planet fed, watered, uh, and generally happy and healthy enough that we don't end up uh, suffering, or, or worse, right? Uh, some other problems. In the wealthy world, what's the ir irony of the current uh, world situation as far as uh, health issues? In the United States, and increasingly we're seeing it in places like China, as people become wealthier, but what's happening with the state of, of, say, children's health? Let's start with that, because I think you guys must have read something about that. It's one of Clinton's big campaigns these days within the United States. What's the stereotype of an American? Obesity. So it's what? One third of the population as a whole is to an unhealthy extent overweight. In some states, childhood obesity is 50%. So we have health as another issue. Ironically, it's sometimes the wealthier a country gets, the more uh, Health becomes uh, a problem from, from uh, eating too much of the wrong foods. And are we becoming happier? In general, do we see indicators that the richer we get, the happier we get? How does it reach? How, does anybody know offhand the statistic of Americans on antidepressants? It's a huge industry, right? So you could argue that happiness is also another uh, crisis in the world. 
no matter how much we get, we still don't seem to be happy, right? So um, these are, does anybody want to add to the list? I meant this to be more interactive. I meant you guys to come up with the list. Oh, well. Anybody want to add to the list? Hunger. Hmm? Hunger. Okay, so we got hunger, which uh, in the less developed world is the issue. To some extent in the United States, we also have hunger, uh, which, which makes it all the more uh, sort of um, absurd that we have these issues of uh, obesity in, in, in certain parts of the population. So sustainability, health, happiness, the rest of today, uh, the, the rest of this really uh, less than half hour will cover um, some examples where uh, Indian companies or traditions are actually uh, ahead of us. First of all, the definition of sustainability is just how do we keep going, is a, is a, a quick and dirty definition. It's providing for the needs of today without destroying the ability to meet tomorrow's needs, right? It means nothing more than that. Is anybody taking notes for extra credit? Remember, you need to list five things that you learned from today. So this, this could be one. <laughs> yes, they are. This definition has been around for decades, and it's funny that people still don't know what it means, because it's, again, the most fundamental question, the most logical question. How do you meet for your needs today without destroying your ability to meet tomorrow's? Arguably, the goal of every institution, every company, should be zero impact, right? Absolutely no negative impact. That should be the, the goal, right? There's only one company in the world that, that set that goal and working towards it. But the funny thing, it's, uh, there's only one company that's actually achieved it on three metrics, and it's an Indian company. Uh, those of you who've had my class, we, we talk a lot about Interface and the great example that they've given, right? They're, they're the, the American company that has set the standard for setting an ambitious goal. But it's ITC. Ironically, uh, the name used to stand for Imperial Tobacco Company uh, in, during the British Empire, right? Now they just, uh, now we're just ITC. Um, but they are the first carbon negative company in the world, the first company, just like that Indian campus I mentioned, <laughs> that harvests more water than it uses. And this is probably the most impressive. It uses waste from other companies to make products and uses some of its own waste from certain product lines and certain businesses as raw material for others. Nobody's asking for an example. Nobody wants to challenge me. How is that possible? All right, one example is fly ash from burning coal. Unfortunately, for now, we're still burning coal all over the planet. You have tons and tons of fly ash which can be used as a building material if you put it into cinder blocks, for example. So that's one example where waste from one system can be used as a raw material for another. In fact, sometimes people pay to dispose of waste. Here's a situation you can get your raw material for free. The other company gets rid of its waste for free. Everybody's happy. If you're really crafty, you charge another company money to take away its waste. So you're actually making money when you get your raw materials rather than spending money on them. Uh, all right. If, if you really want to be crafty like that, sign up for more business classes and we can teach you how to be crafty. But uh, for now, we're talking about saving the world. Right? But uh, no, they're not doing this at the expense of their company, right? They're, they're still, the shareholders are very happy. They're making a lot of money. They're a very profitable company. Um, so this is an example of a company that's showing that, look, we, we can still exist. We can still make our owners happy. We can still keep our employees employed. We can still produce products people want. We just do it in a way that isn't self-destructive, isn't fundamentally crazy, right? The system as we have it is crazy. This is the enlightened, correct approach. Wouldn't we all agree? All right. Uh, if you want to read more about it, I, I found uh, of all their uh, information online, this one to maybe be the most uh, rich in terms of examples. Uh, you'll read about how they turn waste into um, the, the program for dreaming up ways of turning waste into money is, is wealth out of waste. Wow. Everybody will remember that? All right. Uh, next up, Prahalad's bottom of the pyramid. Sean, I'm going to put you on the spot because you had a course. 
with me and we covered this. Pop quiz for you.